Some of you may already know about PTAC, but just a, a quick overview. The Procurement Technical Assistance Centers were funded by the Department of Defense, and um, we provide services free of charge throughout the United States. And in Washington State, we have um, eight or nine PTACs that are available locally to give you a hand. So, um, so what is it about your company that's going to be impacted by doing government contracting? Legal and accounting, technology, human resources, sales and marketing, and production and service. Um, you know, I just kind of clustered the five areas in any small business. It doesn't matter if you're doing landscaping or accounting or manufacturing or construction. Um, you know, you will have a product or a service that you want to uh, make available to government agencies. Uh, next slide. So in the, uh, we'll start with legal and accounting. And, you know, you really need to get all your ducks in a row before you get started. So do your homework. And we really recommend that you have good legal and accounting counsel. And um, they're gonna give you guidance in regards to uh, whether or not you should be a proprietor or if you should be some sort of a, a corporation. So if you are a proprietor, it's essential that you get a federal tax ID number and do not use your social security number. And um, if you don't have a federal tax ID number, the IRS really makes it simple. It's an online application. All you have to do is Google IRS online tax ID number, and it will um, give you that information like within um, 10 minutes. So you can print out your, your letter with the, your tax ID and just to get started. And then, you know, do you know the difference between an LLC, an LLP, a PLLC, a S Corp, a C Corp? And if you don't know, you really need your legal and accounting counsel to help you delineate, um, you know, which is the best for you because of the impact on uh, taxes and liability. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Um, so. Let's talk about accounting. When you start a business, you should have a business plan. And if you do not have a business plan, then uh, it's essential that you think about really the, the road that you're gonna go down. And you, know, you have to have some concept as you know, why are you doing this? Why are you opening up this company? Um, what kind of revenue do you expect to uh, attain? What kind of expenses, you know, are normal in your industry? Um, you know, are there seasons of the year that, that come into effect on your income? Uh, all of this comes through a business plan. If you need help with your business plan, we, we greatly recommend that you start with um, the SCORE office, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, and usually they are housed within the Small Business Administration offices. But if you want more information on SCORE, um, you know, put a little note in our chat and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on, on that. Um, the other thing is, if you are a small business, odds are you use QuickBooks. And this is all fine and dandy right off the bat. Um, but if you are into like high manufacturing and production, um, you know, aerospace or anything like that, the reality is that you will probably need to upgrade your QuickBooks. And the Part of the big reason for this is because the federal government requires um, a lot of compliance and a lot of reports. And QuickBooks really does not have the muscle to do that for you. 
So it, it's really important that you uh, um, understand that going into it. You know, if, if you're just working at a city or county level, that won't be as important as if you're doing a federal contract. And this is with the assumption that you are a prime contractor. But if you are a subcontractor, um, you know, QuickBooks would be okay. So you just have to kind of pay attention to, you know, the, the fork in the road that you go to and um, what your, your current accounting system can deliver for you. Um, the second uh, type of accounting system is called Wide Area Workflow. And welcome to the world of acronyms. And from here on out, um, on the whole track of government contracting, it's all about the acronyms. Um, wide Area Workflow is used by the Department of Defense. And some agencies like the Veterans Administration, you know, they have a different accounting system. Uh, but the reality is that your accounting department will need to become familiarized with um, sending the, the government a bill. Um, and with that, uh, yesterday I got a, a call from a, a client who was concerned about the turnaround time on getting paid. And the federal government historically has been um, really uh, on top of things for, for getting um, the payments out. So if you have not received a payment within 30 days, then um, you, know, you probably need to call your contracting officer and see if there's a problem. But normally, you know, it should be uh, 30 days before you receive your uh, deposit. Um, real quick on, on the previous slide, um, it was all about cost accounting. So if you're doing production and you have cost of goods sold and indirect and direct costs, cost accounting to the federal government is not like your college class. It is uh, full of rules and regulations, and you can specifically look up cost accounting in FARS 31, which is the Federal Acquisition Regulations, and uh, it'll give you everything you ever needed to know about um, government. Um, all right, so moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk about technology. So if you have borderline ability using computers, it is going to be critical that you get up to speed if you are going to do any government contracting. The days are gone where it was, um, you could just fill out a, a bid and sign it and mail it in. And now everything is electronic. So um, if you don't have the skills, you need to take classes hire someone to help you. And the number one thing is to get high-speed internet. And our goal for the Olympic Peninsula is um, all about broadband out there. And um, there's so many rural areas across the state that don't have high-speed internet that this actually creates a problem. Um, previously, I had a lot of clients that um, would do work for the US Forest Service. And some of these guys are in really remote areas and they had a really tough time communicating you know, with the, uh, the contracting officer. So uh, high-speed internet is not necessarily an option anymore. It's uh, um, a reality that, that you need, it's a requirement. The other thing is you need to have a real email address. If your email address ends with gmail.com, hotmail.com, yahoo.com, aol.com, uh, odds are your emails will never get through any government firewalls. So we recommend that you get a real email address like govsales at mycompany.com. And, um, and Actually, if you develop this email address and then configure it so that it will go to 
a, a couple key people in your company. And the reason for that is, you know, if the proverbial bus comes and, and takes out uh, the guy who's in charge of your government stuff, uh, it puts you in a really tough spot uh, for lack of anybody else in the office knowing what's going on. And, and I'll tell you a real quick uh, story here. I had a very large client in Spokane. It was in the summer, in a hot Friday afternoon. Everybody wants to leave and go to the lake. And um, he called me up and he said, um, we are desperate. We have this federal contract and it involves millions of dollars. And we are not getting paid. And we don't know if there's a problem because the guy who was in charge of all this retired at the end of the last month. And so we had to do some really quick calling and uh, get this one individual registered as the point of contact with the federal government and update the email address so that you know everything would not be lost in you know the the loop here but um you know configuring an email address to go to two people is uh good checks and balances for any company when it comes to really big projects and then simple things like keeping your antivirus software updated uh, the reality of knowing how to zip and unzip files and, you know, understand what the cloud is and recognize that things could land in your spam filters. So you have to kind of check those daily. But um, yeah, th there's so much about the technical part of this that um, you really have to have the wherewithal to uh, uh, move through it because one of the, the things that you're going to see as we go through this conversation is um, being responsive and responsible for federal contracts. And by being responsive means that you know how to fill out all the paperwork. So anyway, just you know, pay attention to the technology side of, of, of your business. And now we're gonna move over to the HR issues. So talking about human resources, the number one thing is everyone in your company is subject to scrutiny by the government. If you hire any felons, you're required to submit criminal records and fingerprints uh, to the FBI and get those individuals they they can be approved but if you're doing a, a big project um out on the naval base or over at joint base lewis mccord or fairchild air force base um say you're doing a roofing project and you have uh, a couple of these guys trying to get on base they will never get on base unless they have been cleared uh through the um uh fbi um, let's talk about debarment. Debarment is through the excluded parties list system. And this indicates that you have not been debarred, also known as blacklisted. And if um, your key man on the project has been blacklisted by the federal government, he cannot work on this project for you. And it is also the same for your CEO, your CFO, and you know anybody authorized to make payments or sign for on this account. Um, so debarment is a record that needs to be maintained in your HR files um, because if you're audited, you have to have proof that um, they were not debarred. Um, HubZone is a geographical location. And if you are located in a hub zone, which most of the Olympic Peninsula is hub zone, and um, you can get this certification 
And in order to get the certification as HUBZone, you have to um, uh, provide documentation. Sorry about that. You have to provide documentation with proof of residency for your employees um, that, you know, like a utility bill or something. And anyway, there's a lot more detail about HUBZone. So um, we will, um, we'll go into that a little bit more in, in the next session. Excuse me. Um, and then lastly, the affirmative action policy, you have to have an employee handbook. You have to have an affirmative action policy listed as part of your employee handbook. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about uh, production and service. <clears throat> so a uh, big ruling over the last week about American made priority. And, you know, they, they've always wanted America made, but it wasn't really established as a top priority until, you know, in the last uh, couple of years. <clears throat> and uh, you have to know that some material sources have restrictions. And, you know, if you are, let's say you're assembling cars in the United States, but you get the battery from Canada and you get the uh, tires from Japan, then, um, you know, as long as it's assembled in the United States, that qualifies for American made. Um, but if your materials are, you know, like a, a rare uh, metal or something that comes from Iran, you know, that material could be restricted. So you have to kind of know what's uh, going on with your material sources and if there's any federal restrictions for using those. And lastly, they need um, um, a quality assurance manual. And you know this is required. It's just like your employee handbook. So you know if you're doing production and you make blue widgets, you know, um, where do you get your materials? You know, what is the, the process for making the blue widgets? Um, what kind of coatings do you use on it? it anyway, you know, there's a lot about uh, quality assurance that you have to have written down if you're selling products that you produce. You know, if you're reselling products, you know, um, like toilet paper or, um, you know, shovels or something, and you're not producing them, you just have to, uh, you know, make sure to, to, to find out the source of if it's American made and where the uh, materials came from. So let's talk about um, the service end of uh, production and service. So maybe you do catering or accounting or engineering or lawn maintenance. And um, and so now here you see that you know you have to be responsive and responsible just like they do in production. And the key to this is certifications. So if you're an accountant and you are a CMA, CPA, CIA, CFA, you know whatever it is, you know they want proof of your uh, credibility. Engineering, you know, if you're a PE, um, you know, and if you belong to a, uh, if you're a caterer and you belong to professional catering organizations, you know, that's all part of your proof of um, being uh, responsive and responsible. Okay, so let's move on to marketing and sales. This is an all day class by itself. So with marketing and sales, the first thing you wanna do is not take the shotgun approach to marketing. And so again, you have to pull together some kind of a marketing plan um, and, and figure out who you want to 
sell your products to? Who's buying what you're selling? And in order to do that, you have to do market research. And if you're interested in knowing who in the federal government is doing all this, um, PTACs have all the answers for you. So we have a, a session on, on market research on the federal side, but you know, there's also market research on the um, uh, state and local side. And you know, how, how do you even start this? One of the things that we recommend is that you um, hire a, a marketing intern from a local college. Most colleges require, you know, in, in a school of business will require internships. And, you know, if you use a, a graduate level student, you should get some pretty high qualified um, uh, students doing your marketing, uh, your marketing research. And, you know, so, so once you figure out, you know, who your competition is and who you want to sell to, then you need to develop your marketing materials. And the federal government has unique nomenclature for your marketing materials. They call it a capability statement. And yeah, you know, most small businesses are familiar with putting together the, um, you know, a brochure for a trade show. Well, if you're doing a brochure for a trade show and there's federal agencies there, they're, they're very specific about what they need you to um, have on your marketing materials. Things like your DUNS number, your CAGE codes, your PSC, your FSC codes. And I know this all sign, you know, sounds like you know, foreign language, but um, you know, we can walk you through the step-by-step -step process of assembling the necessary material for marketing to a government agency. Um, next, it's all about net networking. Really and truly, it's all about who you know. And I cannot tell you how many contracting officers, you know, they jump at the chance to join a networking event. Uh, we have one scheduled at the end of uh, both the uh, government series that we have and the uh, construction series that we have. So I greatly encourage you, if you have not registered for the networking at the very last one, um, the, the construction one is April 20th and the government one is April 22nd. Um, all the big primes are gonna be there and they want to talk to you and they want to know what you have to offer. And they probably also want to see your marketing materials. But, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, in person or through Zoom meetings or trade shows or professional associations. Um, you know, that's the key. You know, it's just like looking for a job. You know, years ago, well, it wasn't too far back about five years ago, there was a statistic like, you know, 85 or 90% of the jobs that people get are through somebody that you know. And um, so you need to leverage that and, you know, pay attention to who's paying attention to you. So, and, you know, the thing is, just because you build it does not mean that they're going to come. So it's just like bidding on a construction job or any other job. Yeah, you just have to keep working through that. So uh, moving to the next slide, uh, here's a breakdown of the uh, marketing things that, that you need to have. Um, you know, like I started to say, CAGE code, DUNS number, your UBI number, your NAICS codes, PSC, FSCs, any certifications, past performance, your full contact information. Do you take credit cards? Tell us a little bit about your company and what are the capabilities of your firm and your key employees? So what if you're just starting? What if you just left a job and you're just starting a new company? Well, 
as the key employee, it's important that you put your history on there and, um, you know, just make sure that they know that, you know, you have 20 years of experience doing um, engineering or you have five key employees that you just brought on board that all, you know, have decades of, of, of information. And then lastly, you want to be able to delineate yourself from the competition. You know, like you are the only company in the Pacific Northwest that um, can uh, <clears throat> work on the fish passages without any uh, Department of Ecology infractions. You know, so it's all about sales and marketing and doing your research. You know, how many companies, um, you know, were successful, how many were not successful in going down this road. So let's move on to doing business in Washington State. Washington State has uh, like a one-stop shop if you want to open up a business. And we put the link on here. It's uh, Department of Revenue uh, website that has an open business portal. But before you do this, the first thing that you want to do is um, get your federal tax ID number and um, have that available so that when you do the Washington State one, you'll have your federal tax ID number already. And so when you start doing it, um, <clears throat> you'll have to go through the Secretary of State. If you are not a proprietor, uh, which means if you're an LLC or any kind of a S Corp or anything like that, um, you have to register with the Secretary of State. You have to look at the licensing requirements. Um, you know, if you are an accounting office, um, you are required to have, your CPAs are required to have 120 hours every four years in continuing education. And so, um, you know, and the state tracks all this. So if you're uh, an engineer or a teacher, you know, there's licensing requirements that you have to pay attention to, employee issues, and, um, you know, Department of Labor and Industries, Employment Security, you have to be aware of this if you hire any employees. And then, you know, where, where are you going to do your business? Are you located in Port Angeles? Are you located in Seattle? Um, different cities and different counties have different licensing requirements. So you need to find that stuff out. And then uh, let's talk about insurance and bonding. Uh, in construction, you know, bonding's an issue, but you know, if you are uh, mowing lawns, maybe not so much, but um, the insurance and bonding, we had a, a great session on Tuesday on insurance and bonding for the construction industry. And so if you need resources on insurance and bonding, uh, let us know and, and uh, we can point you in the right direction. And then once you get everything done, the state will issue you your universal business indicator, your UBI number, and then you'll be ready to, uh, to get going. So the next slide on here is a quick little screenshot. Um, okay, the, the screenshot that we have is from the Washington State Electronic Business Solution. And they just sent me this updated report. And I know it's probably a little hard to read. So we're going to move to the next slide. And um, I summarized it. It's uh, the one with the orange panel on it right there. And um, so this has that same detail. And I added uh, some of the historical information on here. So if you're looking to do business with the state of Washington, um, in 2003, they had 662 companies registered. And now in 2021, 
uh, they have 20,121. And, um, and they changed the, the next row, which is the Washington State Small Business Requirement. Um, so now they have 8,253. But what I wanted to talk to you about is OMWBE and the VOSB DV or SD VOSB um, agencies. So the Office of Minority and Women Business Enterprises, they actually uh, oversee the registration for minority business owners, women business owners, uh, women minority business owners, and, um, and then the veterans, the veteran-owned small business and service disabled veteran-owned small businesses um, are also registered in here. And why do we care about this? It's because uh, the state agencies are looking for uh, disadvantaged business enterprises. And uh, you can see that over the years, there was you know, some pretty substantial growth. And then we kind of dropped this last year because of uh, COVID, but they still have a really tough time meeting their goals. Um, for uh, purchasing. And um, if you are in the transportation arena, the WashDOT and USDOT look for disadvantaged business enterprises all the time. So we can talk a little bit more about that later. So the next slide is what's the difference between the state and the US federal government. Most states do not recognize federal certifications. So if you are a veteran and you are certified from the Veterans Administration, that does not make you automatically a state of Washington veteran owned small business. If you are a minority, the federal 8A certification does not qualify you as a state of Washington minority business enterprise. If you're woman-owned, federal woman-owned small business or economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business does not qualify you for state of Washington women business enterprise. And if you are hub zone certified with the feds, there's nothing like that in the state of Washington. And if you're doing DOT, WashDOT and USDOT have some simil similarities and um, that's as close as it gets. So if you're interested in any of these certifications, what it means is that you have to do double applications for state and federal. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. And this is doing business in Washington state. So um, from the things that I just showed you, uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services, we have their link and you would need to be registered with them. And I'll show you a slide a little bit later. It's a real simple application. Um, the Washington Office of Minority and Women Business Enterprises, I have some more information on them. And then the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs, we have more information on that also. So let's move to the next slide, which is the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services. And these are the guys that buy everything. Um, so here's the link to the registration process. And <clears throat> excuse me, you're gonna have to uh, figure out your commodity codes. Are you, you do roofing, painting, electrical, landscaping, accounting, you know, lawn mowing, consulting, <clears throat> and, um, and you wanna make sure you sign up for email alerts. Um, I'm actually registered uh, on this portal and every time they have anything to do with uh, teaching and academia, I get a notice of it. Okay, next slide. This is uh, how simple or complex the the vendor registration is for Washington Webs. And um, it's like one big long thing. You know, there's like five little boxes, like 
you know, what's your name, what's your company information, you know, what's your ownership demographics, um, you know, what kind of certifications do you have, and where are you located? So uh, that, that really is kind of painless to fill out. So the next slide is all about the, the women, uh, the Office of Minority and Women Business Enterprises. And um, here's the link, here's the certifications. And of these, the DBE is probably the most prevalent of all of these. Uh, next slide. And uh, this slide is uh, just a screenshot of their application. And what you really need to know is that state agencies are allowed to charge you for registration. Federal agencies will never charge you for registration. Um, so anyway, if you are a sole proprietor, it'll cost you $50 and you want to be certified as a um, DBE, AC DBE, um, they have a, a $20 charge. And the, um, the AC DBE is airport concessions. Um, it, anyway, so um, there is a fee for that. But if you want to be um, certified as uh, any of these entities, DBE, MBEs, um, there's a lot of paperwork that you have to uh, provide to them. And, uh, but PTAC can help work you through this. And also uh, OMWB can help you with this also. <clears throat> so the next slide is all about the uh, Washington Department of Veterans Affairs. And the main thing on here, the takeaway with this and well, with all of them is that you have to be at least a 51% owned um, by the veteran. And if the company is 50-50 split, you have to uh, do some uh, additional research and compliance. And we have a telephone number here and on the next page, um, go ahead and click to the next page. Um, and anyway, um, so if you contact Jennifer Montgomery, she'll uh, help you through this. And this application was really uh, pretty simple. They need your DD-214, uh, your UBI, your NAICS code, um, whether you're a uh, veteran-owned or service-disabled veteran-owned small business, and then other documents, which you know include like some financials and stuff like that. And then after you register, you'll have a downloadable decal that you can uh, put on your marketing materials. Um, and Jennifer is, is an incredible resource. So if you have any questions, um, she's been there a long time and you know she can help walk you through this. So, Next, here, yeah, you know, this is it. This is a reality check. It takes a lot of dedication, commitment, precision, and organization to do government contracting. Um, and you can't be naive. There are always a lot of really great offers. Um, and I get, I get offers from these guys out of Florida who want to update my registrations for me and only cost me $3,000. And the reality is um, these are not legitimate. And you know, once you get registered in the federal database, it's like they just come out of the woods, um, you know, looking for you. But um, PTAC can help guide you through these. Um, the third thing is your accountant and your HR manager should probably get a raise. Yeah, if you go into federal government contracting because they have additional work that they need to do. And it's really hard to be a one person small business. Um, you'll probably need to get some additional help. And the first place you should call should be your local PTAC. And uh, with that, 
um, we're going to open this up and maybe answer some of your questions. And um, and instead of leaving the slide up for the any questions, let's move it to uh, the last slide. And um, which has all the contact information on there. So uh, Jessica, if we would you put up that contact again? But in the meantime, let me uh, look at the the questions in there. And give me a second here. And yes, we'll be emailing the slide deck to to everybody after the presentation. And. Um, we also, um, all the, the sessions are recorded and they'll be available at a later date. And let's see what else. Um, we have a couple questions. Uh, yeah. The first question is, how do you find out if one of your employee or uh, 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 someone on the administrative team is debarred? Well, you have to go into the federal database and you type in their name and uh, social security number, and uh, it, it'll say, hopefully it will say, uh, no response found. And if it says that, you print that out and you put that in the HR file. Um, if it does come back and you'll see a lot of uh, debarments in the healthcare industry, and those are all about uh, Medicare fraud. So, um, but yeah, you have to go to SAM.gov and you can do that without being registered in SAM. Uh, you can just use it as a search mechanism. Um, but it, anyway, yeah, the, and, and so if you're looking to hire somebody for your big project, big government project, when you do their background check, you need to do the EPLS uh, excluded parties list system to see if, if they have been debarred because you don't want them on your team. Okay, so next question is? Um, you mentioned the hot zone certification earlier. What are some benefits to be hot zone certified? Um, hot zone is one of the mandated set asides for federal contracts. And um, I, I think it's a 5% set aside um, for hub zone. And well, the federal government has to set aside 23% of all federal contracts. And of those, they set aside for woman owned, veteran owned, minority owned, and hub zone agencies. Hub zones are based on geography, based on the census. And um, so hub zones have a tendency to move unless it's in a really rural area like the Olympic Peninsula. And it, um, um, the big advantage of hub zone is you are a rare commodity that all government agencies are looking for. The other advantage is that you have a 10% bid preference on uh, bidding on a contract. So um, if, um, if oh, I'm gonna call somebody out here, Robert Strom is bidding on a contract with me and he's hub zone certified and I am not. And I bid $100,000 and he bids uh, $110,000 because he's hub zone he gets that 10% break and uh, he would be awarded the, the contract if all other things were equal. 35% um, of your employees have to live in a hub zone. And just in the last couple of weeks, they made a whole bunch of changes on uh, because of COVID on hub zone, your company moving or your employees moving. So there's a, a bunch of updates on it. But you have to, uh, when you do the hub zone certification, that has to be approved by the SBA, and you have to uh, provide supporting documentation on all of your employees and uh, keep a spreadsheet as to who's in and who's not in the hub zone. So, um, any other questions? How are we doing? 
Uh, yes, Paul, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, my question is, are registered agents required services after you get your once you once you get your business license and registration from the state of Washington, so specifically your registration from the Secretary of State's office, let's say our example is Government One Stop LLC, we're yeah. registered with the state of Washington, and uh, our and we have uh, our documents on file, our reg state registration, our annual filings. They're on file with a, a registered agent. Is that a required service, or can you actually keep those documents yourself? No, you can keep them yourself. Oh, okay. Um, and actually, um, you know, you you can do everything your, yourself. You know, usually what happens is if you went through Legal Zoom or somebody, you know, they they would do all that for you, and they would be the registered agent. And yeah, you know, the caveat on that is then they charge you for their services. But if you're uh, bright, intelligent, and capable individuals, and you have a good accountant and a good lawyer that will guide you, you can just do it yourself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So any, any other questions here? Um, um, Lynn, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure, thank you. I am just wondering what are some of the most frequently hired services by the state government and by the federal government? It really depends on the agencies. Um, if you're the U.S. Forest Service, you know, they're looking for uh, loggers, you know, guys with trucks. Uh, not necessarily accountants, um, but they also look for caterers and uh, people that can provide uh, shower stations during firestorms, uh, transport vehicles. So it, it really depends and, and uh, PTAC can help you uh, figure out like for your particular industry, um, who is it that was buying? you know, what you're selling. So, so if, if you do uh, graphic design and wanted to do uh, work on developing capability statements for other people, you know, that would be small business. But as a graphic designer, if you wanted to do something for um, um, the U.S. Forest Service, you know, they would have to have a contract looking for somebody that maybe could design a new signpost, you know, for one of the parks or something. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you really have to kind of know the, the type of industry each of those are in. And, uh, but no, we can, we can help you filter it down because initially it's overwhelming, you know, on where to start, but, you know, we start with you and, you know, after a little discussion, we try to figure out where to take you from here. Thank you. Tarek, okay. would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hi there. So I make animated videos, usually educational, and I was wondering how um, the America made policy would affect bids. I use a mix of local animators and international animators to produce the videos. And I was just wondering if, if you need to have a certain balance of 50, 50, uh, you know, international versus local or, or how that affects the whole thing. Um, in the promotion of your videos, are, are they uh, assembled American made? Hmm. Or, or good question. Are, are, they, are they assembled uh, Japan? Yeah. Right. So, so sometimes it, it varies all the time. So sometimes the graphic work can be done in one location and then the actual animation or putting the pieces together can be done in another location. So okay. it depends so, on the project. Yeah, because you're uh, an American company and these are your products. Um, you know, it, it uh, you know, I could do some more research, but I think that um, it, it really is uh, American made because you are the, 
producer or assembler or Got you it. know okay yeah cool thank production you production company yeah yeah i i guess it wouldn't be any different than uh movie making you know where they go to um ireland and you know they have irish extras sure and then, um but it's edited and and you know everything else the coloring everything else is in the u.s and then published here got it okay thank you you're welcome um leslie you mentioned earlier it's important to get a dbe certified um can you go into details on what are some benefits once you become a dbe Okay, uh, DBE is a disadvantaged business enterprise, and um, which means that you are economically and socially disadvantaged. Historically, it it uh, it provides uh, another avenue for uh, people of color, and um, so you know, socially disadvantaged is. Um, you know, based on religion or gender or, you know, sexual preference. So, you know, there's a number of, of different things that come into play. But the economically disadvantaged um, at the federal level, um, just right off the top of my head, uh, you cannot have more than $350,000 a year on like your W-2 you cannot have your individual net worth more than I think $750,000. Your company cannot have more uh, net worth of $1.6 million. So yeah, there's a lot of criteria on that. And when we get into the certification section, um, which is um, next week, We'll, we'll go into that into some depth. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. And if not, I'm gonna pick on someone that's very lucky. Um, Mel, I see you very dedicated and smiling. Would you mind introduce yourself briefly and let us know what you do? Uh, my name is Mel Gildow. Um, I'm in a startup business and uh, working through uh, what opportunities are available uh, in the federal government, local state government, and private industry uh, for transportation services. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. So Jessica, Mel and I actually uh, talked on the phone not too long ago and uh, has, you know, some really great innovative ideas and it's just a matter of getting everything collated and right into place and oh by the way mel um the guys from navfac and uh <clears throat> um two, two naval contracting officers are interested in attending our um networking event at the end of the month so oh fantastic uh, i'm planning on being there oh good good okay thanks thank you so there is so much on the reality check and now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take you into uh, a one-hour version of government contracting 101 <clears throat> so you'll see that uh, uh, maybe some of the you know previous stuff will show up there but um, we'll get going and, um, you know, it's the same team as before. And, and I wanted you to have this little uh, bingo card. <laughs> You're welcome to, to play along. But I just thought that uh, considering the, the topic that we're dealing with, you may need a little distraction. All right, so. Let's talk about the Washington PTAC program. PTAC's funds are discretionary and allocated each year by Congress in the Defense Appropriations Bill. The Department of Defense Defense Logistics Agency 
enters into a cooperative agreement with PTACs across the state. That means that um, local economic development offices, um, local colleges, you know, we partner with everybody uh, to provide PTAC services. Uh, you can't just have a standalone PTAC office, it's always a partner. And for Washington PTAC, we're uh, provided by uh, Thurston Economic Development Center. And then we have sub centers across the state uh, in Spokane, Vancouver, uh, over in uh, Kitsap. So there are 93 PTACs in the US and they employ 400 counselors. And I guess we have 12 counselors now in Washington state. So next slide. So <clears throat> we provide services across the state selling to federal, state, and local governments. And this means finding opportunities, interpreting the solicitations and regulations, getting people certified and registered, marketing to the government buyers. And we, we do this service by providing workshops, one-on-one -on -one counseling, matchmaking events, and the optional bid match service. So what is bid match? Bid match is a resource that would come into your mailbox uh, once a day, once a week, however you schedule it, and provide specific opportunities to you based on what you're looking for. So when you sign up to be a PTAC client, um, you list your you know industries and you know, if you're in construction, but all you do is roofing or all you do is painting, you know, we look through that and uh, we'll fine tune it for you. Uh, we offer a month free of charge. And then after that, I believe it's uh, $165. Uh, next slide. So this, this slide here, is a little disconcerting to me. <clears throat> and when I was getting it ready for the slideshow, I thought, you know, you can't even read that because there's like no comparison because the, the number on the right is so big, everything else is distorted. And um, so I just circled the, the ones that were really too small to compare. But everything in black is Washington State. Everything in orange is national competition. So if you're a woman-owned small business in Washington State, it had 576 people. Um, across the nation, 25,762. So breakdown for 8A, which is a minority business, uh, veteran-owned small business, hub zone, and then small business in general. So um, to try to compete locally is a lot easier than competing nationally on great big project, projects. So, so that's actually why we um, um, talk to small businesses about trying to connect with a prime contractor and being a subcontractor um, to begin with. All right, next slide. So why do you want to sell to the government? Well, they're the world's biggest customer. They buy just about everything and they spend over 576 billion with a B for goods and services. And all of this will be amended based on this last year. And you know, every year we have updates on these numbers. Um, yeah, their checks never bounce and they're open to any business. And we have a list here of some of the government uh, markets like the Navy, Joint Base Lewis-McChord, US Forest Service, um, Washington State, Army Corps of Engineers, 
Veterans Administration, Housing and Urban Development, Small Business Administration, Defense Logistics Agency, and uh, GSA, General Services Administration. And of all of these, if you're in uh, production and manufacturing or supply goods, the, the one entity to pay attention to would be the General Services Administration. So put that in your notepad. All right, next, next slide. So in here, we have state procurement reform. And um, this includes the Department of Enterprise Services. And, and they have uh, oversight over everything that anybody that the state agency buys. Um, <clears throat> they look to uh, purchase from small businesses, which are classified as either 50 employees or less than $7 million. And that classification is based on um, uh, commodity codes. And then if anything is uh, set aside as a sole source, that means that the sole source is, has a unique product and anything that is sole source has to be uh, approved previously. So uh, next slide. So Washington State has certain uh, thresholds that they, they buy things from. Um, when they buy directly, it has to be less than $10,000 for goods and services, not including taxes. And if it's um, less than $13,000, it has to be made uh, oh, less than thirteen, dollars but more than ten. dollars It has to be made from a micro business, mini business, or small business. And the micro business it uh, has to have gross revenue less than $1 million. A mini business has to have annual gross revenue of between one to $3 million. And a small business has to have 50 or less employees or the annual gross revenue of less than $3 million. And you see this average over three consecutive years and um, or it can also be certified through OMWBE as woman business, uh, minority business or disadvantaged business. But the three year averaging, uh, you see that's kind of a standard at the federal level and the state level. Um, and you know, this is all according to the RCW and you can look that up in your spare time. So let's talk about uh, the Department of Enterprise Services. Uh, the Department of Enterprise Services uh, is strictly for business. And what this means is, um, you know, they're looking for services or products and we're gonna show you just a short series of screenshots here. So um, go ahead and click on this, Jessica, for business, and then it'll take you uh, to the next slide for current con contracts. Okay. So on this uh, page, they have a contract search tool. And this is where you can actually go in and see um, what their, you know, what some of the current contracts are. And actually the janitorial services contract was just awarded and they selected 10 janitorial services throughout the state and awarded their contract. Um, in regards to construction, the uh, construction contracts, um, they have a couple main awards and then they have 
regional awards also for the construction contracts, but you can go in this contract search tool and find more information. And on this next page, uh, it gives you an example of um, like aluminum uh, boats and uh, for Casey State Park and um, Long Lake access area. Anyway, it kind of gives you an overview of the organization, like the Department of Transportation, or if it's parks and recreation or fish and wildlife. Um, and these are state agencies. So you see over here on the uh, left-hand side, it, you know, if you were registered, you could go in and update your own commodity codes. Um, you know, what geographic area you're looking to uh, pursue business. Maybe all you want to do is stay on the Olympic Peninsula and stay in Jefferson and Clown counties. Um, anyway, it's just a screenshot of uh, the interior workings for the state of Washington Department of Enterprise Services. So now we're going to move on to state certifications. And in the uh, Washington State Small Business, you can self-certify in WEBS. And those are the screenshots that we had earlier. And uh, I'll show you more in depth as we go along. But, uh, and, and this is, you're just attesting that yes, I'm a woman-owned small business or I'm a veteran, but you know, you're not certified yet by the agencies like OMWBE or Department of Veterans Affairs. And this gives you a, a good listing of the um, um, abbreviations for each of the titles, the Women Business Enterprises, uh, Minority, Disadvantaged, and Disadvantaged uh, works as a federal and so does the SBE, Small Business Enterprise. The, the difference on all of these options is the SBE, Small Business Enterprise, is for any small business that does not fit any of these other classifications. So, you know, if you're... Um, you know, can't be classified as a veteran or a minority or woman, um, you still have an option. And then uh, the last one on here is for the veteran owned. And again, it's veteran or service disabled veteran owned business. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so the federal government, what are they buying? Organist services, dirt bikes, Classes, Star Wars stickers, flying comedy acts, all of the above. So think about it. You know, would, would the federal government actually buy Star Wars, Star Wars stickers? And the answer is it's all of the above. Yes, they do. <clears throat> they, um, um, you know, if it's for their recreation centers or if it's for childcare facilities, uh, church services, yeah, the federal government does look at all of these. So next slide. Oh, this is fun. Um, lots of uh, little arrows here. So how does the government buy things? What's the order? So remember when we talked about the blue widgets? Okay. If I am stationed out at Whidbey Island and um, it's a naval base, so I need blue widgets and I go to my storeroom and I don't have any blue widgets. The next step is I have to go to other agencies and, you know, and I've already tapped out the Navy to see if anybody has blue widgets. So now I'm going to check with, um, I don't know, USDA or um, maybe uh, Department of Interior. And if they don't have any blue widgets, 
then they have to go to the federal prison systems to buy their product. And if the federal prison systems do not manufacture blue widgets, then I have to go down to the, the, the next agency, which is called the um, NIB or NISH, which is the Blind and Severely Handicapped Ability One. Uh, go ahead and click through that, Jessica. Thank you. And this is for uh, people with severe disabilities. Uh, Lighthouse for the Blind in Washington State is a very active um, Ability One uh, resource for the federal government. They, they actually make whiteboards for conference rooms. And uh, so if they don't make blue widgets, then I have to go through uh, GSA, DLA, DVA, or any other military control inventory points. Um, GSA is like Costco to the federal government. And odds are, well, you know Costco. Sometimes you go in to buy your favorite thing and it's not there this week. Um, GSA is the same way. So if they don't have the blue widgets, then finally I can look, put this out to bid and see if your firm or other commercial sources are available to uh, purchase this from. So when you look at this list, one more click, Jessica. Uh, when you look at this list, there are six items on it. <clears throat> and you are number six. So um, keep that in mind when you're looking at, uh, you know, how much activity is going on. And, you know, and if you have a unique product, um, odds are, you know, none of these uh, agencies above you will have it. All right. So let's move to the next slide. And we're going to talk about uh, federal procurement thresholds. So what all can they buy and what's the dollar amount? So the first is a $0 balance, which is a micro purchase threshold. And that's a direct buy, no competition required. And they generally use their government credit card, which is called a government purchase card. So years ago, um, I think it was the uh, Fairchild Air Force Base needed like 12 refrigerators. And because it was under the threshold, it just went to Lowe's and bought 12 refrigerators. So how do they know to go to Lowe's and not to Fred's appliance store, you know, or whatever appliance store you own? Yeah, you know, it all has to do with your marketing. So, you know, if you sell something that's under the threshold, uh, they need to know who you are and what you sell. So uh, the, micro, the micro purchase threshold is $10,000. And um, anything that is above $10,000, but under $25,000, go ahead and just click through this, uh, Jessica, is, um, is they have to have three quotes on it and, before they can uh, buy it. In. And then if it's over $25,000, it has to be posted in, uh, we used to be called Fed Biz Ops, but now that's incorporated into SAM.gov and SAM.gov is the universal resource. Yeah, you know, they're trying to pull all these little sub things in together, but SAM.gov will be your one-stop shopping. Uh, most of it's populated, but not all of it yet. And then if there, uh, if there is a simplified acquisition threshold, of two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, that is auto, excuse me, automatically set aside for small business unless an exception could be found. So um, 
actually, I had a client in Spokane that received a um, set aside. Actually, I had a couple of clients that received a substantial set aside uh, because they had a very unique product. And, um, you know, and that, that was like 10 years ago. And they're still selling these to the federal government. So um, that was good that they got themselves to be known for getting this product. All right, next slide. So if I am looking at a, um, an opportunity, what are the steps? So the agency first has to establish the requirements. Yeah, well, what, what do we need? Well, we need, you know, maybe I need 1,200 refrigerators. <clears throat> and um, then they have to determine the set-asides. Well, how do they do that? They have to look at the goals that they are mandated to achieve by the end of the federal fiscal year. and uh, see how they're doing. If I've met all my goals for uh, woman-owned small business and hub zone and minority businesses, and I have not met my set asides for or my goals for um, the uh, veteran-owned small business, odds are I'm going to set this aside for a veteran-owned small business. And, and then after we determine, you know, what, how we're going to set it aside, they have to prepare the solicitation and make an announcement of it. And the announcement will uh, show up if it's over $25,000. It will show up in the federal business opportunities section of SAM.gov. And they, they call that um, contracts now. <clears throat> Um, and then the potential contractors will locate the solicitation. You know, they're looking for the NAICS code for appliances, kitchen appliances. And so they come upon this and once they see that and they had a chance to review the solicitation, they will submit a bid and a proposal. And after it is submitted, the agency will review this and evaluate all of the, the bids and proposals and then make a, um, an award The you know, they'll award the contract and then the contractor has to perform the, you know, the scope of the work. And then after they perform, they have to submit an invoice and receive payment. So uh, it's always, you know, just because you want a contract doesn't mean they just give you the money uh, upon completion. You have to submit the payment and uh, or submit the invoice and then receive the payment. Okay, so moving on. So, how about a little vocabulary test? Thing, words like source of sought, pre-solicitation, RFQ, RFP, IFB. You know, it's alphabet soup. And, you know, there's lots and lots of resources that PTAC has that can give you all of this information. Um, but when you download the uh, PowerPoints, if you look in the notes on the slides, you'll see the definitions. Sources sought, a tool used by contracting officers to find suppliers. Pre-solicitation, phase in procurement process. It's a type of notice on fbo.gov, which is sam.gov. So anyway, it, uh, yeah, he, after a while, they become second nature. Um, number seven, NAICS code, North American Industry uh, Classification System. And again, that's, uh, that's also governed by the US Census Bureau. So um, we have lots and lots of resources for you. 
So we'll move on to the, the next slide. All right, so where do you get started? A um, good place to start is with the Small Business Administration. And we have the Seattle office information here. But if you're not in the Seattle area, uh, contact us and we will have, um, uh, we'll get you that information. Um, they will help you assess your business, find the basic requirements, um, show you how to win contracts, what kinds of contracts there are, size standards, governing rules and responsibilities, prime and subcontracting. So one of the, the coolest resources they have is actually the size standards. And you can download a spreadsheet that lists, um, you know, you can do a find for roofing and it'll pop up with the, uh, <clears throat> the right NAICS code for you. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so what kind of federal certifications are there for your business? Well, small business and that certification is self-certified and that is evident through the NAICS code that you choose as your primary NAICS code. So if you are in the construction industry, um, I think the NAICS code is 36220. It, uh, you can be, be classified as small business one of two ways, either by dollar amount or number of employees. And for construction, it's by dollar amount. And I don't know what the dollar amount is right now. It used to be $36.9 million. So if you make less than $36.9 million, um, you would be classified as small business. Um, there's a aerospace um, NAICS code and it's also classified by number, number of employees and not by dollars. So you think of companies like Boeing, where they're working in billions of dollars in revenue. Um, if they fall under 1,000 employees, they will be reclassified as small business. So a lot of the aerospace um, smaller companies um, are in the same um, classification um, un unless, you know, I mean, if it's a thousand or less. So I think you'd be surprised to know how many are actually in there. So veteran-owned small business and service-disabled veteran-owned small business that has been until recently certified through the Veterans Administration and it was just recently assigned to the Small Business Administration. So there's some changes on the process for doing that. Uh, same thing with woman-owned and economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business. That used to be self-certifying, but now it is moved to the SBA also. Hubzone small business, that's all SBA certified. And then the 8A small business, and 8A is a uh, nomenclature for uh, minority-owned small business, uh, socially and economically disadvantaged small business. And uh, so all of these now are under the auspices of uh, the SBA. Next slide. Okay, this is my favorite slide. SAM, SAM.gov, not SAM.com. And don't just Google SAM.gov and click on the first link that pops up. Um, remember when we talked earlier about all the scammers and fishers and um, SAM is the, the greatest resource for these parasites to um, replicate. So 
it has to be the official sam.gov website. And the number one thing, and <clears throat> excuse me, they just updated this to indicate that SAM is free. And, you know, you can register, update, you can do everything you need to do, and it's all free. And the thing is that all these other scammers, they charge you hundreds and thousands of dollars to get registered on the um, federal. And it's exactly you know, what we were talking about earlier um, with Paul, that they were, um, you know, these guys are the agent. And so they're registered in SAM and they are your agent in SAM. And so every year they're gonna get the renewal notice and you're gonna get a bill for their services. So if you just do it yourself, you'll save yourself a lot of money. So in order to, to access SAM, first you have to create a user account. And this is you, the individual. It's not you, the company. And after you have created your user account, then you have to register your entity below your user account. And if you have multiple companies, you can have all your companies under your one user account. And then you can, um, manage your account, you can activate, deactivate, uh, you can search for uh, debarments, you know, say you had an opportunity to work on a, um, a project and you wanted to bring a, a subcontractor in, uh, maybe a plumber or something, yeah, you, know, you need to do your due diligence and see if they have been debarred, you know, before you bring them on board. And then other search records, um, there's all kinds of things you can do here now. So uh, the things that you can do, next slide, is uh, look for contract opportunities, wage determinations, excluded parties list system, assistance listings, uh, entity registrations, federal procurement data systems. Um, the last one, the FPDS, is uh, it's an awesome site for finding out quickly, you know, who's buying what you're selling. And um, or, you know, you are coming toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with another company and you want to do some research on them and you're going to see you know, how much they've done in government contracting, you know, and what their NAICS codes are. Anyway, um, all this will be rolled up into beta SAM, but for right now, FPDS is still outside of SAM. So um, right now it's pretty easy to use, but, you know, and, you know, you can look anybody up. See, that's the thing about the federal government is the Freedom of Information Act. And I want you to know that I have no secret logins to any of this. And, you know, when we get into some depth next week, um, you know, if you're sitting at your computer and you have more than one screen, you know, you're welcome to, to work along with me and go to these websites and um, you know, kind of do some exploring on your own. So anyway, uh, right now, SAM uh, is called beta.sam.gov, and it's transitioning over to full sam.gov. And I think that that will happen by October. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, I saw pop up in the chat something real quickly about IT. So let's talk about CMMC, Cybersecurity Maturity, Maturity Model Certification. This started in January of last year. 
for the Department of Defense as a five-year rollout. And um, there's five different levels and it applies to all subcontractors and requires third-party certification. <clears throat> so let's say that I have a uh, IT company. My IT company has to be CMMC certified and you have to go through the process to get this third-party certification. And let's say I am a, um, an accounting office and I um, have, I don't have an in-house IT department. I contract that to somebody else, but I'm doing uh, federal contracts. My IT department that's outsourced has to also have third party certification. So there's a lot going on on the uh, CMMC. And this is a week long class all by itself. So if you are in the IT arena, um, I would search out uh, upcoming classes uh, for PTAC or it, you know, just Google CMMC certification. And PTAC has some really good resources for you that, that we can uh, send your way if you need the resources. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at finding opportunities. So in Washington Webs, this is state of Washington, um, you get enrolled and it will, it includes regional agencies like Port of Tacoma, uh, Port of Seattle, um, you know, community colleges of Spokane, you name it. If it's a state agency, um, it's in there. So you go to Washington Webs to do some research. Uh, Fed Biz Ops, which is Sam, and uh, you could set up a search agent, and it will update you with uh, opportunities. And then the last one on here <clears throat> is uh, the bid match that we kind of talked about earlier, and it covers uh, federal, state, county, city, and um, all the U.S. And it looks by keywords and you determine the keywords. So if you're doing um, hull cleaning, so Mel, what was the, the name? Hull scrubbing, that's right. Mel's company is hull scrubbing. So if he puts in the word hull, the word scrubbing, the word barnacles, whatever, they will um, find that for you. And then we'll send you uh, uh, updates on the opportunities. Um, because if you start looking in 15 different places for opportunities, that can be overwhelming. So wouldn't it be nice just to have it all in one email? And um, so, you know, and, and this kind of uh, gets back to if you're a sole owner and you're looking for opportunities, this can be very, very time consuming. <clears throat> so, you know, again, it may be that you brought in a, a graduate student and, you know, they're, they're looking through your emails, looking for these opportunities, um, you know, or maybe on Saturday and Sunday when you're not at work, you're actually looking at opportunities. Um, <clears throat> and so after our 30 day free trial, yeah, $165 a year. And there's 41 federal sites in this system, in addition to FBO and DLA and 40 international sites and almost 2000 state and local sites. And if you wanted to, to look at state uh, of Idaho, you know, that could also be included in your, or Oregon or Montana or Alaska, wherever, uh, we can do that. So, all right, 
so you've registered. So now what? Um, well, here's that big red flag again. When Sam is validated, watch for unsolicited proposals. So I'm also registered in Sam. I have a little company of my own. And um, those guys from Florida have been telling me that my Sam is going to expire and they can help me renew it. So what, what I love is the ones that call me up and uh, want to offer me their services. So I let them do their little spiel. And then I tell them, oh, by the way, I am Washington PTAC. So um, I really don't think I need your services. <laughs> but anyway, um, just watch out for that. So the, the Washington Electronic Business Solutions, I have the link on there. And then another really excellent site for municipal research. It, and this is like um, little towns in Washington, um, little library districts, you know, they're not doing everything through the state, but they do it through the MRSC, small works rosters. And um, you can register on here for free. I think you can also pay them, it used to be like $25 a year. Um, and get a little more expanded service. But the free service is all I ever did, and I got a lot of stuff from them. Um, prime contractors, people like Qit, people like Skanska, uh, Veneer, uh, Brook and Brook, you know, they have uh, lists that, that they're looking for, for people on. Um, it's important for you to, to figure out who your target market is and then actually market it to your target. And you know, the, the searching is continuous. Um, you're always searching for opportunities. So finding the opportunities, next page. Um, maybe your big opportunity would be as a subcontractor, not a prime contractor. So let's say that um, Cuit comes to the Olympic Peninsula. They have a large prime contract and they are looking for subcontractors because as a prime, they are required to have a small business plan that will <clears throat> um, set aside certain percentages to woman-owned, minority-owned, uh, veteran-owned small businesses. And so as a woman-owned small business, uh, you know, if, if you do catering um, and you catered one of their, um, you know, quarter, you know, if you did their quarterly team meetings or something, they, you know, on this project, you know, they could, um, you you know, you could be towards attaining their goal for the woman-owned small business. Um, you know, watch the credit card purchases and small dollar requests, you know, the under $10,000. You know, if, if I'm um, a little bakery and uh, I know that the U.S. Forest Service can come in and buy, you um, a hundred dozen bagels and pay with a credit card, um, I would be, you know, looking for that kind of activity. Um, GSA activity, you, you know, GSA, the Costco. Um, look in, and see, you know, who who's uh, selling things. Like if you do fire extinguishing equipment and, um, there's a, a local vendor in the Seattle area and you make a unique aspect of, you know, this product um, or they don't have like, I don't know, uh, uh, a one gallon fire extinguisher, you know, you could sell to them. <clears throat> so you look at the GSA holders and uh, approach them for your products. Em <clears throat> Emergency purchases. This is a big one. If you've ever 
been through a firestorm or fire season, uh, most of the rules and regulations kind of go out the window. Um, when the big fires over in Chelan, uh, they were trying to get as many you know fire trucks as they could get there. And you know who they called upon to come and help put out the fire was the local fire district. And the, so the local fire district, you know, was up in the national forest, you know, you know, they were, you know, they were still protecting their own territory, but, you know, they were doing that uh, as an emergency purchase. And then at the end of the um, fire season, the fire district, actually, I think it was out of Snohomish, um, they, uh, we had to get them registered in SAM so that they could send a bill to um, the USDA for the Forest Service. So emergency purchases are something you, you just really need to pay attention to. Um, well, and look at all the COVID things going on. Um, you know, same thing, you know, it, it was, you know, adamant that we had, you know, protective equipment and, you know, these are emergency purchases. And then the Defense Supply Center, um, you know, everything DOD, you know, they house through the Defense Supply Center. And uh, I had a client that has a, a unique product that services aircraft. And uh, originally, they tried uh, to, to get the, the airlines to use it. And, you know, didn't have much luck on that. So they went out to Fairchild Air Force Base and talked to the crew chief and did a demo. And um, I think that was like 13 years ago. And now it is on every Air Force Base for the United States government. Um, so it, anyway, you know, it's opportunity and, and knowing, you know, where to look and, and who to talk to. <clears throat> so um, let's move on to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit more about marketing. Uh, it's all about identifying and targeting only the key buying activities. Um, you know, if your specialty, if you're the baker and your specialty is bagels, uh, but you also make, I don't know, uh, sugar-free donuts, um, you know, you should be, you know, as a sideline, you should be targeting on the bagel sales. And you need to visit with the small business specialists. Um, those are also called small business liaison officers, um, buyers, and end users. So uh, my client on the aircraft thing, he went right to the end user, which was the crew chief on the aircraft. And, uh, you know, but he had to get permission to get on base and do all this stuff. And uh, it takes a little bit of effort. Always take your promotional materials tailored to those particular buyers. So, you know, if you're a consultant and you consult in IT and accounting and uh, graphic design, and, um, you know, you go to an agency that is only looking for graphic design, you should have promotional materials uh, tailored to just graphic design. It's like your resume. You know, if you've done a lot of different things in your life, you want to have a resume that uh, one for accounting, one for teaching, one for, um, you know, bicycle repairman, you know, whatever. Um, and then always make sure that on the federal brochures that it includes your DUNS number. Um, oh, and they're changing the DUNS number to the UEI. And um, when you when guys come to my marketing class, I'll tell you why they're changing. Um, and it's not a good story. Um, cage codes and uh, NAICS numbers, competitive advantages. 
uh, know the procurement cycles, go to every trade show and event, and look at agency forecasts and budgets. And that's another thing that uh, PTAC has. Uh, next slide. Um, we have agency forecasts. We have a resource called usaspending.gov. And then again on SAM with the Federal Business Opportunities. Uh, but the agency forecast, you can go in and see what they're projecting that they're going to need. So, you know, if you're FEMA or Health and Human Services, uh, nobody could have anticipated that they would need all of those medical supplies this last year. But moving forward, you know, coming out of the pandemic, you know, they'll have other needs. So these are really good resources for you to uh, investigate. So getting ready to wind her up here. So there are rules to live by. All things government, you know, the federal government has no mercy with you in regards to uh, excuses. So do not be late, do be responsive, do not lose your passwords and don't share them either. Do not pay for, for what you can get for free. Get it in writing, be proactive, call PTAC with questions. So let me tell you the thing about the passwords. Once you start doing government contracting, every step of the way, there's a new agency, a new username, a new requirement on your password. This one needs eight characters, uh, alphanumerica, no symbols. This one needs 20 characters and will expire after 90 days. And so you have to develop a record system to maintain your passwords. I personally use a digital vault and um, it amazes me how many things are in there, but it comes in really handy when, you know, I can't remember, you know, what it was or, you know, it's all alphabet soup and, you know, Anyway, there's a lot of ways that, that you can maintain your passwords. Um, and then the uh, be responsive. That means uh, paying attention to your email and completing all documentation correctly. And bottom line, remember to sign your bid. That's the number one item for being um, not considered is uh, no signature. So with that, tick tock, we're right at 214 and uh, we're ready for questions. So what have we got here for questions? We got several questions here. Um, so, Paul, I'm going to get to your question probably last because you have uh, a couple. So the more the merrier. Uh, I believe Abby has a question. Abby? Hi, I apologize. My audio is a little wonky, but um... Yeah, I had a question about the DBE cert. So I've tried to get that cert before and it's a little um, more complicated, more in depth. Um, and the actual OMWBE website, they don't really have an option to um, have somebody help you out on that. I was wondering if there's a resource um, or an agency or some sort of um, something that we could actually talk with and um, go over what they're expecting of us um, besides just uh, kind of the blank general questions that they ask on their website. So 
Abby, I used to host the uh, OMWB workshops at in Spokane, and um, we were there for hours, and everybody was just filling out their information, and then their team, you know, their team came from Olympia to do this. And since it's a brave new world of COVID, I'm sure everything is virtual now, but it seems to me that uh, an OMWBE workshop would be worth its while. Uh, but in the meantime, um, PTAC can help you. So Abby, where, where are you located? I'm located out of Bothell. Oh, okay, so King County. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> We have um, PTAX uh, in King County, Pierce County, and um, you know, we can help you with this. Uh, I'm actually assigned to the Olympic Peninsula, but um, Abby, if you want to uh, uh, put your, uh, well, actually we should have you on our list. So let me look here real quick. Abigail? Yes, that's me. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Thank you. Okay. So um, I have something I can add to that. I'm actually in an OMWBE online class starting the 14th. Um, it's at three o'clock. So if, if you go there having a certification 101 program starting that day, it's like the next, it's three Wednesdays starting April 14th. So she might be able to find that. They're having one right now. So Abby, you okay. might want to check that out. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Trisha. Okay, well, good. It's teamwork. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Trisha. So, okay, so who's next? Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to let Paul go. Paul, uh, you can unmute and address your questions, please. Thank you, Jessica. My questions are, let's see, the first one I have, in Washington State, are direct buy limits the same for technology services? And uh, not, I, yeah. Can you pull up that slide again, too? I was hoping to... Uh... Oh, on the direct buy? Yeah, you had a great slide there, kind of gave an overview of, in, for Washington State, kind of the, kind of the different limits for micro purchases and... Let's see, where was that one? Uh, it's slide number nine, yeah. <clears throat> so um, I, I don't know that it actually does any, uh, you know, discrepancy between IT and, you know, the, the criteria is, you know, if it's under 10,000 or under 13, if you're micro, mini, or small. <clears throat> But any, anything over that, um, you know, you have to be qualified as a small business. So um, we could, you know, we can uh, reach out to uh, to them and, and find I'll, out. I'll, I, I'm I'm glad to uh, help you with that one too. I'll I'll look that up and then provide that right after the class. Because I'll right, try to you. answer my own question and I'll, I'll give you the link and everything because it may be, okay. uh, I used to work, uh, retired from the state, um, but it seems like that may have been a different, I know they were the same at 10,000 and then they went through a period. So, you know, maybe they've adjusted back, but I'll, I'll check that one out. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, and then my second question is, um, do you have to be a registered vendor for federal government like micro purchases. So let's say, and maybe I think you already answered this, but you can, can you just, you know, get on the phone or send an email and uh, sell your products or services directly to the government without becoming a registered vendor if you're underneath those, um, those uh, the direct buy limits? Um, yes, you can, but it's not recommended. What's recommended is a networking event and and so um, on our event coming up at the end of the month uh, would be a really great opportunity for you to um, communicate that to the agencies that we'll have here. 
Oh, excellent. But, you know, cold calling, you know, they're not really uh, interested in the cold calls. You know, so it, it's all about who you know. So, it, you know, if... Um, You know, and, and we can do introductions. You know, PTAX can do introductions. So, you know, if there was an agency that, you know, like a Forest Service or somebody, you know, that uh, you just wanted to know who it was, I would introduce you to, and then, you know, you would take it from there. Well, that's excellent. Yeah, that's, that's great information. The ad, uh, let's see. Oh, and then just along that line, uh, regarding the email you mentioned, like email addresses, like don't use a Gmail and that type of thing. Um, yeah. But, you know, your, your company, and we have one, it's, you know, info, I-N-F-O at govonestop.com. Uh, yeah, my question, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, I'm beginning to wonder if the emails are actually passing through those spam filters, even while I've been on the phone with uh, uh, mayor's offices across the country and that kind of thing, and I'll be sending an email right then, but they're not getting it. So are, are you sending it using the info app? Yes. Uh, okay, so I, I would just, you're an IT guy, you, you, you can create your own yeah, email. It is, app. and I didn't, that's, that's created, and it's based, yeah. you know, it's using the company. But I guess my question yeah. is, a, is a, it's a kind of a notch up from that is, uh, how can you ensure that your company name is not being filtered out in the, the agency or statewide or, or local um, technology um, the security, private, you know, the, uh, the filter systems that they have uh, it is one way I'm wondering, you know, once you become a registered vendor, do they communicate with the other IT folks and say, Hey, this, this business is registered, go uh, ahead and include that yeah. email address in that filter. Yeah. No, they don't. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> but it, you know, for, um, you know, to, to get it through like the Naval base or something, um, you might just call them and ask them, you know, if you didn't, you know, would you look and see if it's in your spam folder? And if it's in there, then you, you know the drill after that, you know, just please whitelist it or whatever. And so that it'll, it'll go through. So I, I think okay. probably I the, yeah, the, the, the phone call would probably be the, the most efficient way to make sure it's getting because you know that once it it gets to that one individual you know it should come through that whole yeah. uh, agency whatever the dot mill it is <clears throat> yeah absolutely no and that's a great tip because you know just an aside here from once covid started it, it's 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 really been a challenge now to reach people via the phone and oh, yeah. through the emails, you know, it's that, yeah, yeah, it's really a different way. And, you know, having worked for the state you know, over 20 years, it, it, very, very much of a different situation now. Oh, I know. So, okay. Yeah. Great tip. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, last question. Does Washington state use NAICS codes or NIGP codes or both? Uh, Washington state uses the uh, NIGP. And for sure, and uh, I think sick codes, and I don't believe that they use the, the NAICS codes at all. The, the feds use the NAICS codes, but you know, NAICS codes are, have been kind of uh, homogenized and you know, I, I see them in a lot of different places. So it wouldn't surprise me if uh, you know, they, if they did, but the NIGP, I know, is what they primarily used. Okay, thank you. I just love this session. You guys are great, <laughs> so thank you. It's really helpful. Well, you know, and, and I feel bad because, you know, each one of these is just a little itty bitty bit of a conversation. What would happen, you know, I'd have like a two hour class and, uh, and then, you know, the students would meet with me afterwards, the businesses and, and, you know, next thing we do, we'd set up an appointment and, you know, we'd work through things, you know, in another couple hour session to get them, you know, up and running. So, 
Um, but you know, the days of the face-to-face -face meetings, you know, are, are are not there unless you're digital. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you know, and then there's compromising uh, scenarios. You know, not enough bandwidth. You know, you live in the woods, or you know, dropped it, or whatever. And yeah, so it makes it hard. Mm -hmm. But uh, so um, Jessica, ask one more. Yeah, go one ahead. One more question. It's related. Yeah. Uh, is this class the same today's, the introduction of government contracting, going to be the same or similar to the general track on, let's see, the April 13th? Or maybe I'm getting these backwards. So, um, so that's, this is that's, the general track. Okay. And then the other one is the, the, the contracting. Yeah. So um, on, on mine, we're going to... Um, on the government side, so next week it's all about registrations and certifications where we're going in depth on both of those. And then the week after that, it's the marketing <clears throat> materials and market research. And you know, so there, you know, this was kind of like the tip of the iceberg today, mm -hmm. but you know, we start going in depth in those. Um, there'll be four areas um, over the next two weeks, and then we'll do the capstone at the very end. Super. And for anyone that would like to attend the April 13th session and you have not registered for that track, you're more than welcome to send us an email. Uh, I'll put both our emails uh, down in the chat so we can get you registered there and then send you the link. So I have a question. Do we have a minute for that? Sure. Uh, so <clears throat> my company is a professional service um, and we've been in business for 30 years. And in the mid nineties, we were trying to get on a GSA schedule, but at that time, their uh, process uh, didn't work well for us and we weren't able to do it. So now, you know, I'm, I've registered as a business, you know, all of the different areas but how do I get in front of the GSA? Because my service is best fit that particular administration, but I don't know how to how to market with them, or or how to. Because I mean, I registered on Sam. I'm in. I've done everything on all the steps of what they want you to do, but I'm I'm not getting anywhere, and so I, I can't seem to get in front of them before the next bid comes through. Let me so the, the thing with GSA is, you know, they come to a lot of events. And um, actually, the Arctic region GSA is located in Auburn. Did you know that? Yes. And one of my very favorite people just retired from there. And she moved back down south or something. Um, but, um, you know, we have some contacts. PTAC has some really good contacts um, out of that Auburn office. And, um, you know, we can um, do a, a soft handoff, you know, of you to them and, you know, see where it can take you. But, um, and, and I'm on a, a, a mailing list for GSA. Are you on their mailing list for, upcoming events and changes and stuff? No, and that's where I'm gonna be next. <laughs> that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do is how do I how do I build this back up? So that's apparently my next stop. <laughs> okay, so when when we get done, I'll send you um, the the link for the GSA registration. Um, or maybe maybe if we have a second I'll, I'll see if I can find it here. Or um, I'll ask Andrew. Um, if you could uh, look that up for GSA uh, event list. And in the meantime, I'm going to look in my email because I think I just got one. Um, okay, it, it'll take me a few minutes to look it up, but I, I'll, I'll look and we'll see if Andrew can... Uh, uh, pop that into the chat here before we leave. Thank you. 
Okay, and then um, Rachel, who is it? Uh, Rachel Hunter wants to ask about GSA. So unmute yourself, Rachel, and talk to us. So, you know, GSA, it really and truly, it's like dealing with Costco. You know, you have to know who the buyers are and, um, you know, what, how you can, to get on a GSA schedule is difficult. We had a series of workshops a few years ago um, when I was Spokane PTAC. <clears throat> Actually, we had them in Olympia. Uh, with GSA there, uh, doing a complete walkthrough on the whole process. And matter of fact, I think I still have one of their uh, uh, textbooks here. But um, it, anyway, it um, you know it takes a lot to get on the GSA schedule. Um, usually, what happens is you need to, um, if you have any kind of an inventory, you know everything has to be you know, gone through on the quality assurance. And, you know, there's a lot of rules and regulations that you have to abide by before you can even, you know, put your foot in there. So, um, you know, I, I can look that up, Rachel, and uh, send that maybe to you and, and uh, uh, Tricia. Um, Rachel, you are more than welcome to unmute yourself if you want to ask your question again. Um, no, that was helpful for now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so, Leslie, for new people that are new to government contracting, uh, what is who is GSA and why they are significant? Yeah. GSA is the General Services Administration. They take care of all of the federal buildings. They take care of uh, <clears throat> uh, being the Costco of the government world. And you know the um, um, the federal building aspect is a whole different ball game for GSA. You know, maybe you do uh, maintenance and you want to be a, a, a janitorial service for, federal buildings, you know, uh, you know, that may or may not be in the uh, GSA supplies, but it would show up as a, uh, a service uh, bidding opportunity. So, oh, lots of online classes. Thank you, Andrew, for, for finding that. So um, is there one, I see Southwest training. It, is there one that is uh, Northwest training on there? Do you know if the GSA goes by, uh, you know, like the FAA has different quadrants, like we're, I think, 10 for the FAA. Does the GSA have that same kind of uh, a makeup or is it only state by state, do you know? No, it, it's uh, quadrants <clears throat> um, because uh, Alaska, Idaho, Washington, I don't know if it's Montana or Oregon, but yeah, it's a, it's a quadrant. Okay. Thank you. But, and, and I suspect because our uh, colleague who retired uh, left that, you know, the Northwest, the Arctic region uh, may not have staffing to do that yet. And so we'll, we'll see. Um, Leslie, you mentioned uh, the sole source uh, earlier, can you go into details on what that means? 
Um, so, okay, a real life example. There was a, um, who is it, Malmstrom Air Force Base in uh, Montana needed uh, new fuel tanks installed and um, one of my clients in Spokane, HUBZone certified, um, did fuel tank installations and geographically, you know, this was a concern, you know, because it had to be kind of expedited and, you know, there's nobody in Montana, nobody in Idaho, you know, nobody in North, South Dakota. And so they sole sourced it based on geographic location uh, to the Spokane company. And they went over there and, and it was uh, a couple million dollars, you know, for a sole source that they had to do. Uh, I had another sole source uh, opportunity, actually it was the Jackson Federal Building. So this was GSA, did a sole source for um, the commissary there. And um, it was a 8A woman-owned small business um, that uh, received the contract from Spokane in the Jackson Federal Building. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's just all kinds of really uh, unusual things that, you know, you, you never think in your day-to-day -day operation. But, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it was a good opportunity. For, and they were there for, what, five years on, on that contract. And then, you know, the, the aircraft guy, the um, defueling mechanism that he had, um, it's not... Uh, it was never a sole source, but it was um, put out to bid and they were the only ones that could do it. So, you know, it, it worked out well for them. And like I said, they're, they're in every single Air Force base around the globe now. And now the commercial lines have also picked them up. So that, that was a win-win for everybody. Anything that you need, um, get in touch with uh, PTAC. And you know, if it's Seattle, Spokane, Tri Cities, uh, we'll put you in connection with with the right person and get you started on your way. So uh, thank you again for for coming, and and I, I hope to see most of you again next time, uh, next week on registrations and certifications. So. Um, it'll be a good class.